Thank you for being here today. I think you know everyone who is here. Let me start on my far right. Uh, Gareth Rhodes, who is the Deputy, Deputy Superintendent of uh, Department of Financial Services. He's worked with me for a long time from the Attorney General's Office, and he's uh, part of our SWAT team. We have James Malatris, President of uh, Empire College. Dr. Howard Zucker, Health Commissioner. Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. Robert Mejica, Budget Director. Uh, we have a lot of interesting news today. Things are moving. Uh, current status. We still have the trajectory going up. Uh, we have not turned the tra trajectory, nor have we hit the apex. Remember what that line is going to do. It's going to go up. It's going to reach a high point. It's going to tip. It's going to go back down. We're still on the way uh, up the mountain. Number of infections that have been coming in, 80% still self-resolved. About 15% of the people who test positive require hospitalization. And then there are uh, degrees of hospitalization, right? But the total universe that requires hospitalization is 15%. The, we use projection models. Uh, we have Cornell Weill, which is a great medical institution that does projection models. We use McKinsey that does projection models. The Department of Health does projection models. Uh, the projection models are important because they are projecting the possible trajectory and projecting the possible need, right? So we're planning for a need. The projection models do that. The projection models are, are just that. They are models of projections. They're not uh, necessarily definitive, but it's the only device that we have to plan, right? Follow the data, follow the data, follow the data. The, uh, actual hospitalizations have moved at a higher rate than the projected models, than all the projected models. Uh, so that was obviously concerning because that higher infection rate means faster, higher capacity on the hospitals, and that's uh, the critical point for us is the number of people going to hospitals. Uh, right now, what we're looking at is about 140,000 cases coming into the hospitals. The hospital capacity is 53,000 beds. That's a problem. We're looking at about 40,000 ICU cases coming into the hospitals. We have about 3,000 ICU beds. Uh, that's a challenge. What is an ICU bed for these purposes? Basically a bed with a ventilator. The ventilator is the most critical piece of equipment for an intensive care unit bed because this is a respiratory illness uh, and people need more ventilation than usual. What do we want to do? Reduce the number of cases coming into the hospitals, slow the number of cases coming into the hospitals. That's what Dr. Fauci is talking about on TV every day. Flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. Slow the number of people coming into hospitals so we can deal with them in the hospitals. Uh, and we are working on that. At the same time, increase your hospital capacity, right? So s try to slow the number of cases coming into the hospital. Meanwhile, raise your hospital capacity. We are working on both simultaneously. We have been from day one. Reduce the number of cases coming in, flatten the curve, slow the spread of the infection. We are doing everything we can on that. That's banning non-essential workers, that's social distancing, that's closing restaurants, closing gyms, uh, just flatten the curve, slow the infection rate. Uh, one issue we had was in New York City where we had a higher level of density than we wanted, especially in the New York City parks, especially with young people. I've been as direct as I can uh, and as blunt as I can on young people and the misinformation that they have. You can catch the coronavirus. Uh, you may think you are uh, a superhero. You're really not. You can catch it. And you can transfer it, which makes you dangerous to the people who you love. But the New York City parks uh, have been a problem. I saw the problem myself firsthand. I spoke to Mayor de Blasio. I spoke to Speaker Johnson. We said, come up with a plan in 24 hours. 
uh, that everybody agreed with. They came up with a plan. We're now implementing that plan. I signed off on that plan. Uh, the plan is going to pilot closing streets in New York City because we have much less traffic in New York City. We have many fewer vehicles in New York City. Open streets. People want to walk. They want to go out and get some air. You want a less dense area. So pilot closing streets to cars, opening streets to pedestrians. Uh, the, we'll also enact mandatory playground social density, which is probably a new concept. No close contact sports in a playground. No basketball, <clears throat> for example. Uh, you cannot do it. We're asking people to do that on a voluntary basis. If there is non-compliance with that, we will then make it mandatory and we will actually close the playgrounds. We don't want to do that because playgrounds are a place to go out and get open uh, air, but you have to exercise social density even in a playground. And again, it's voluntary. Uh, the mayor is going to make it clear that this is important to the people of the city. If it doesn't happen, we will actually close down the playgrounds. I don't want to do that, uh, but we do need to reduce the spread of the infection, and that is what is most important. Uh, this is very interesting, because the evidence suggests that the density control measures may be working. And again, we're doing this from projections. But look at this because it's interesting. This past Sunday, the projection was that hospitalizations were doubling every two days, okay? On Monday, the numbers suggested that the hospitalizations were doubling every 3.4 days. On Tuesday, the projection suggested that the hospitalizations were doubling every 4.7 days. Now, that is almost too good to be true, uh, but the theory is, given the density that we're dealing with, it spreads very quickly, but if you reduce the density, you can reduce the spread very quickly. So these projections, I've watched them bounce all over the place, and I don't place a great deal of stock in, in any one projection. All due respect to all the uh, great academics and statisticians who are doing it. But this is uh, a very good sign and a positive sign. Again, I, I'm uh, not 100% sure it holds or it's accurate, but the arrows are headed in the right direction, and that is always better than the arrows uh, headed in the wrong direction. So to the extent people say, boy, these are burdensome requirements, uh, social distancing, no restaurants, uh, no non-essential workers, yes, they are burdensome. By the way, they are effective and they're necessary, and the evidence suggests at this point that they have slowed the hospitalizations. And this is everything. Slowing the hospitalization rates coming into the hospitals are everything so the hospitals can deal with the rate of people coming in. At the same time, increased hospital capacity, what is the high point? You see that line in the beginning? What we're studying is what is the high point of that line? What is the apex of that line? That is the point of the greatest number of people coming into the hospital system. So that's our greatest load is the apex. And when is that going to happen? Again, that is a projection. Again, that moves around. Uh, but the current projection is that could be in 21 days. So ramp up the hospital capacity to make, uh, to be able to handle that apex volume. How do you ramp up hospital capacity? You ramp up beds, you ramp up staff, and you ramp up the equipment, and the ventilators are the problem uh, in equipment, as we've discussed many times. Uh, where are we on that? Beds, we may need 140,000. We have 53,000. That's the existing capacity of hospitals. We told all hospitals they have to increase their capacity by 50%. I told them that myself on a conference call yesterday. Uh, this is uh, a burden for the hospitals. 
uh, to now say you have to increase capacity 50%, but I have to tell you, uh, they were very generous about it and they understood what we were dealing with uh, and they were eager to step up to the plate. If you increase hospital capacity by 50%, that gets you 27,000 beds. On top of the existing, it takes you to 80. S some hospitals, I asked as a goal, try to increase by 100% your capacity. 50% was the minimum. The goal was 100. I believe some hospitals will actually try to do that. And I encourage them to try to do that, as impossible as it sounds. Uh, but now is the time to be aggressive and do things you've never done before. If some of them do that, and I believe some of them will, uh, that would be an additional 5,000 beds. We get to 85,000 beds. FEMA, Army Corps of Engineers, what we're doing in Javits Center, what we're doing in the Westchester Convention Center, Westbury, uh, campus, Stony Brook campus, that's another 4,000, takes us to 89,000. The uh, U.S. Navy ship Comfort, the president dispatched, that would be 1,000 beds to backfill from hotels, that takes you to 90,000. If we take all the state dormitories in downstate New York, uh, that could get us an additional 29,000 beds we'd be at 119,000 beds. Uh, you're still not at the 140 that you need, but then we're looking at hotels, we're looking at uh, former nursing homes, converting other facilities to make up the differential. So, a lot creative, aggressive, but uh, in life, you do what you have to do. And this is, that's what we're doing on the bed capacity. Protective equipment, we have been shopping around the world. We have a whole team that's doing it. Right now, we have enough protective equipment, gloves, masks, gowns, for all the hospitals statewide that are dealing with it. I brought down a shipment to New York City yesterday. Uh, today, no hospital, no nurse, no doctor can say legitimately, I don't have protective equipment. Right now, and for the foreseeable future, we have a supply. We do not yet have secured a supply for three weeks from now, four weeks from now, five weeks from now, but uh, we are still shopping. And taking care of this immediate need uh, was also good news and a good job by the team. And again, we are still shopping for more equipment. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. We have, in the existing hospital system, 4,000 ventilators. This is just in the normal operation of hospitals, et cetera. We have purchased 7,000, and we are still shopping. Federal government has sent 4,000. Uh, we're exploring splitting, where one ventilator could do two patients. Italy has had to do this because they were forced to do it. I want to see if we can study it and do it a little smarter uh, and have a little more time experimenting with it, but we're looking at splitting the ventilators. Uh, we're still working with the federal government to try to find more ventilators, but that is our single greatest challenge are the ventilators. Again, the ICU beds, uh, that really means a ventilated bed. Uh, because, again, this is the number one piece of equipment that we need. St you have beds, you have equipment, you need staff, and you need staff understanding that some staff is going to get sick and they're going to be out. So we have been working on putting together a surge healthcare force. Go back to the retirees, go back to nurses and doctors who may not be in the hospital uh, direct medical care uh, occupation, and ask them to sign up for possible reserve duty. God bless them, 40,000 people have signed up as a surge healthcare force. 2,000 physicians, anesthesiologists, emergency room technicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurse anesthetists, respiratory RNs, LPNs, 40,000 people have signed up. That is a very, that's a big, big deal because uh, you can create beds, you can find the equipment, you have to have the staff. 
and you have to have the staff for those additional beds, which are not now in the hospital system. Uh, and you have to have staff when the existing staff uh, gets ill. Or, by the way, just can't work the hours uh, that we're going to need people to be working. So that's very good. Uh, this is also very exciting. I don't know that anyone else has done this. We've talked about the emotional stress that this brings on people uh, and the mental health stress and the mental health challenges. No one's really talking about this. You know, we're all concerned about the immediate critical need, the life and, the de life and death of the immediate situation, which is right. But don't underestimate the emotional trauma that people are feeling and the uh, emotional health issues. We asked for mental health professionals to voluntarily sign up to provide online mental health services. 6,000 mental health professionals agreed to volunteer to provide mental health services for people who need it. How beautiful is that? Uh, and the hotline, 1-844-863-9314. You can call that hotline. You can schedule an appointment with a mental health professional totally free to talk to them about what you're feeling and what stress uh, you're feeling. And again, God bless the 6,000 mental health professionals who are doing this 100% uh, free, on top of whatever they have to do in their normal practice. And I'm sure in their normal practice, they're busy. So this is really an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, step by them. Federal government, I spoke with President Trump several times. I spoke with him last night. I spoke with him this morning. I've spoken to people in the White House who are handling these operations. I've spoken with the Vice President. Uh, I've spoken with uh, Jared Kushner, who is uh, a New Yorker, he knows New York, uh, and he's working in the White House, uh, and he's, they, he's been uh, extraordinarily helpful on all of these situations. What we're, what we're working on is a common challenge. No one has these ventilators, and no one ever anticipated a situation where you would need this number of ventilators to deal with a public health emergency. So we have purchased everything that can be purchased. We're now in a situation that we're trying to accelerate production of these ventilators. And a ventilator is a complicated piece of equipment. Uh, the president and his team, I think, are using the DPA well because it's uh, basically a, form, it's a, a leverage tool when you're dealing with private companies, right? Uh, we need your help, we can demand your help, or you could agree to help, and we need you to step up and increase production. Even with that, there's a ramp up time for a company to put together the supply chain, put together the workforce, and get these things up and running. So, Ford, you hear, is going to help. General Motors is going to help. The problem is our timeline is so short. We're looking at an apex 21 days in that range. Uh, to get ventilators and these business consortiums put together, supply chain, design team, ramped up and delivered a 30,000 ventilators is an extraordinarily difficult task. Uh, and it's something that our team is working on uh, with the White House team. And I want to thank the President for his uh, cooperation and his team for their cooperation. Uh, we're getting very creative. We're talking to countries around the world, uh, as well as new companies that could do production. We're also talking to the White House about uh, another concept. New York has the greatest need in terms of numbers. New York also has the most critical need in terms of timing, right? We talk about our apex, we talk about that curve. Different localities, different regions around the country are going to have different curves. We are in some ways first. Our case numbers went up first. Our trajectory is first by a long shot. 
uh, different regions will have their curve at different times. What I said to the president and his team was, look, uh, rather than saying we have to provide equipment for the entire country at one time, let's talk about addressing the critical need in that hot spot. Once that hot spot turns, because you have an apex and then you have a curve, and the curve is relatively short, once you address that hot spot with that intensity, intense equipment, intense personnel, then shift to the next hotspot and have more of a rolling deployment across the country than a static deployment, right? I was in the federal government uh, at HUD. I worked on dozens of disasters. You deal with the disaster in front of you at that time, and then you move on to the next disaster. And I think that rolling deployment could work here and on behalf of New York, I said we will be 100% helpful. We need help from the entire country right now. We need resources from the entire country right now. And because our apex is first and our numbers are highest, but the apex uh, high point will be sequential across the country. So I said to the White House, Send us the equipment that we need. Uh, send us the personnel. As soon as we get past our critical moment, we will redeploy that equipment and personnel to the next hotspot. And I will personally guarantee it and personally manage it. So if you send us 15,000 ventilators, and then uh, after our curve, Los Angeles needs 15,000 ventilators. We can take the equipment from here. We can take the personnel from here. We can take the lessons from here. You know, we go first. We're going to learn things that nobody else has learned because we're going to be the first one through the chute. Uh, and I personally guarantee that we will bring that equipment, we will bring that personnel, we'll bring that technical assistance to the next hotspot. I said to the president, I'll be part of going to the next hotspot with our team. We're asking the country to help us. We will return the favor. And we are all in this together. And we're asking for their help and their consideration. And we will repay it with dividends. Uh, the Senate is also uh, considering a $2 trillion bill, uh, which is, quote unquote, relief for uh, businesses, individuals, and uh, governments. Uh, it would really uh, be terrible for the state of New York. The $2 trillion bill, what does it mean for New York state government? It means $3.8 billion. Uh, $3.8 billion sounds like a lot of money. Uh, Rob Mejica, the budget director, can talk you through the numbers, but we're looking at a shortfall, revenue shortfall, of uh, 9, 10, 15 billion dollars. Uh, this response to this virus has probably already cost us one billion dollars. It will probably cost us several billion dollars when we're done. Uh, New York City only gets 1.3 billion dollars from this package. Uh, that is a drop in the bucket as to need. I spoke to our House delegation, congressional delegation, this morning. I said to them, this doesn't do it. You know, I understand the uh, Senate theory and the Republican theory, but we need the House uh, to make adjustments. In the House bill that went over, New York State got $17 billion. In the Senate bill, we get $3.8 billion. Uh, and, well, you just, the big spending, we're not a big spending state. I cut taxes every year. I have the lowest growth rate of the state budget in modern political history, okay? Uh, so we are frugal and we are efficient. I'm telling you these numbers don't work and I told the House members that we really need their help. In terms of numbers, total tested, we're up to 103,000 people. 
New tests were up to 12,000. As of yesterday, about 28% of all testing nationwide has been performed by the state of New York. The state of New York is doing more testing than any state in the United States of America. And I'm very proud of the team on how we've mobilized and gotten this testing up and running. Uh, people ask, how does this testing work? Any hospital in the state can perform testing. You can walk into a hospital in Buffalo, New York. Uh, if you show the symptoms and meet the protocol, you can be tested. Strategically, we deploy testing in the most dense areas. Where do we set up the drive-throughs, et cetera? Why? Because we're hunting positives. Uh, we're hunting positives so we can isolate them and reduce the spread. You're more likely to get positives in uh, high positive areas, right? Set up a drive-through in the Bronx versus set up a drive-through in Chautauqua County you're gonna get more positives in the Bronx, and that's what we want. But anyone, anywhere in the state, you have symptoms, uh, you're concerned, you can walk into any hospital, that hospital can get a test to perform. Number of positive cases, we're up to 30,000. Number of new cases, 5,000. Again, you see the numbers, uh, 13,000, I'm sorry, 17,000 New York City. 4,000 in Westchester, 3,000 in Nassau County. Relatively, uh, Westchester, we have dramatically slowed what was an exponential increase. So again, on the good news side, can you slow the rate of infection? Yes. How do you know? Look at what we did in Westchester. That was the hottest cluster in the United States of America. We closed the schools, we closed gatherings, uh, we brought in testing, and we have dramatically slowed the increase. Nassau County is 3,000. Uh, they're relatively right behind Westchester. They were at like zero when Westchester had started. So uh, we can slow it and we have slowed it. Again, you see it spreading across the state, which we said it would. Current numbers, 30,000 tested, positive. 12% of those who test positive are hospitalized. 3% of the positives are in ICU, okay? This is deep breath time again. I'm anxious, I'm nervous, what does it mean? 30,000 tested positive. 12% are in the hospital, 3% are in ICU. If you look at those 3%, they're going to be predominantly senior citizens, people with underlying illnesses, people with emphysema, people with a compromised immune system. That's what this effort is all about. All the noise, all the energy, it's about that 3%. Take a deep breath. Now, that 3%, that's my mother, that's your mother, that's your sister. These are people we love, these are our grandparents, and we're going to do everything we can to protect every one of them. And I give the people of the state of New York my word that we're doing it. But we're talking about 3% of the people who talked positive, attested positive, who we're worrying about. Most impacted states, we're 30,000. Next closest state is New Jersey at three. California, two. This is a really dramatic differential. And this is what I argue to uh, anyone who will listen. We have 10 times the problem that the next state has, which is New Jersey. You com compare us to California, which is larger in terms of population, we have 15 times the problem. Now you have to ask yourself, why? Why does New York have such a high number? And again, in the totality, we understand what it means, but why does New York have such a high number? Uh, and this is my personal opinion. I like to make sure that I separate facts from personal opinion. 
the facts I give you are the best facts I have. Uh, and again, the data changes day to day, but I give you exactly what I have on a day to day basis. Personal opinion, why does New York have so many more cases than any other state? How can it be you're 15 times the number of California? I mean, it really is uh, breathtaking when you think about it. State of Massachusetts with 30 times the number of cases. So why is the question that people ask me? Two answers. Answer one is because we welcome people from across the globe. We have people coming here, who, we have people who came here from China, who came here from Italy, who came here from countries all around the globe. We have international travelers who were in China and who were in Italy and who were in Korea and who came here. And I have no doubt that the virus was here much earlier than we even know. And I have no doubt that the virus was here much earlier than it was in any other state because those people come here first. That's the first answer. The second answer is because we are close, because we are close, we talk about the, the virus and how it transfers in a dense area. It's literally because we are close, because we live close to one another, because we're close to one another on the street, because we live in close communities, because we're close to one another on the bus, we're close to one another in the restaurant, we're close to one another in the movie theater. And we have one of the most dense, close environments in the country. And that's why the virus communicated the way it did. Our closeness makes us vulnerable. Our closeness makes us vulnerable. That spatial closeness makes us vulnerable. But it's true that your greatest weakness is also your greatest strength. And our closeness is what makes us who we are. That is what New York is. Our closeness is what makes us special. Our acceptance, our openness is what makes us special. It, it's what makes us feel so connected one to another. It's what makes us so accepting of one another. It is the closeness that makes us the human beings that we are. The closeness is that New York humanity that I think exists nowhere else. The closeness is what makes our sense of community. And there's a gentleman who I still look to for guidance and for leadership and for inspiration. He's not here anymore for you. He's still here for me. But he said things more profound and more beautifully than most other people ever have. And one of the things he said that is so appropriate for today we believe in a single fundamental idea that describes better than most textbooks in any speech that I could write what a proper government should be. The idea of family, mutuality, the sharing of benefits and burdens for the good of all, feeling one another's pain, sharing one another's blessings, reasonably, honestly, fairly, without respect to race or sex or geography or political affiliation. That is New York. It is that closeness, that concept of family, of community. That's what makes New York New York. And that's what made us vulnerable here. But it is also that closeness and that connection and that humanity and that sharing 
that is our greatest strength. And that is what is going to overcome at the end of the day. I promise you that. I can see how New Yorkers are responding. I can see how New Yorkers are treating one another. I see the 6,000 mental health volunteers. I see the 40,000 healthcare workers stepping up. I see the vendors calling me saying I can help. That's New York. That's New York. And that, my friends, is undefeatable. And I am glad in some ways that we're, we're first with this situation because we will overcome and we will show the other communities across this country how to do it. We'll be there for them. We want them to be there for us and we will be there for each other uh, as we always have been. 